So E six nine eight G lecture twenty. We have started our discussion on oscillators. So this is the second lecture on this topic. So we started by looking at a negative feedback system. So we took a general negative feedback system where you have some input x of s goes through a transfer function h of s, and then this is fed back. A negative feedback. What is the condition for the system to oscillate? Let's say at a frequency omega naught. H of j omega naught should be equal to minus one. Or in other words, you can also equate the magnitude and phase of this transfer function separately. That gives you magnitude of h of j omega naught to be equal to one, and angle of h of j omega naught. To be equal to plus or minus pi, so you meet either of these criteria, and then you are guaranteed that the system is going to oscillate, right? And what do we call this criteria? Barkhausen criteria. It's also called as a startup condition. Okay. Quick question. Let's say there was a feedback factor in this path. Let me call it as some g of s. How would the function? Does anything change in this expression? Huh. So then you basically <coughs> combine both these transfer functions, call it as something, and you apply that to be equal to minus one, right? It's not the forward transfer function alone that you are uh, concerned with. You are concerned with the total loop transfer function. Okay, so. Once you ensure that the angle of h of s, h of j omega naught is plus or minus 180 degree, what does that imply for this feedback system? At omega naught, ha, the system is not a negative feedback anymore. At omega naught, the system is in positive feedback. Is that clear? Correct. Yeah. Right. So you have taken a feedback system. <laughs> Which was negative feedback at DC, and then you found out the frequency where the system has a positive feedback. Right? Just because you have a connection like this, it doesn't guarantee that the feedback is negative. It also depends on how much phase the forward path or the loop transfer function is providing. Okay. Now, just to revisit some basics, let's say I have a transfer function h of s. If I feed this with a signal cos of omega naught t, what do I get at the output? Huh, so mod of h of j omega naught into cos of omega naught t plus angle of h of j omega naught. Okay, good. Then we saw three methods using which we can analyze whether a given system is going to oscillate or not. What is the first method? Feel free to look at your notes. <laughs> huh. So you compare the given system with the uh, setup shown here. Identify which is the frequency independent negative sign. Identify what is contributing to H of S, then directly apply for these constraints. Right? Second method, you force an initial condition somewhere, maybe inject an impulse current or force an initial condition on the capacitor, and simply see whether the capacitor is going to discharge it or whether it's going to result in an oscillation. Right? And the third uh, method. Uh, you calculate for the impedance at some point and figure out for what frequency that impedance can go to infinity. Right? Use any of these three methods and you can find out whether the system is going to oscillate. So we first took the example of the circuit. Did this oscillate? Why not? It has only single pole. It cannot offer a phase which is more than 90 degrees. Right? Now we were looking at the second circuit. 
where the main transistor-resistor combination remained the same. Just that you were introducing a delay delta t connected in this fashion. We applied method 1. What is the result you got? Ha, so, what is the frequency of oscillation? Pi by delta t. Right? What is the other condition you got? GMR should be equal to 1. So, quickly tell me what is the oscillation period? Oscillation period is 2 times delta t. Right? <laughs> now, uh, I asked you to apply method 2 uh, as practiced by yourself. Can you also quickly apply method 3 and see if you are able to uh, find out any frequency where the impedance can go to infinity. So, you can calculate the impedance at this point. So, let me give the setup for you. <coughs> Let us say I connect a test voltage <coughs> Vx. Let us say the current drawn is some Ix, then Z is given by Vx by Ix. So, you write out the expression, then find out what is Z of j omega and find out for what frequency. Let us say I assume that it can be for some frequency whether this can go to infinity. So, if Vx is applied here, the current flowing in this direction is Vs by R. The voltage here is Vx <coughs> into e power minus s delta t. Therefore, the current flowing in this direction is Gm Vx into e power minus s delta t. So, I can write Ix as Vx by R plus Gm Vx into e power minus s delta t. So, you can simplify this and you will get the expression for Z of s as R by 1 plus GMR into e power minus s delta t. So, Z of j omega naught is R by 1 plus GMR into e power minus j omega naught into delta t. Now, if this transfer function, if this impedance has to go to infinity, the denominator has to go to 0. So, that gives you the condition that GMR sh should be equal to, sorry, GMR into e power minus j omega naught delta t should be equal to minus 1. Now, you equate the real, equate the magnitude and the phase of this on either sides. So, if you equate the magnitudes, you get the condition GMR should be equal to 1. And if you equate the phase, you will get the condition minus omega naught delta t should be equal to pi. Right? So, this gives you the result that omega naught equal to pi by delta t. 
same as a result that you obtained using method one. <laughs> that is true even if you do the method one. If you have uh, multiple points where it can give you 180 degree phase shift and if at all those frequencies the gain is greater than if so you find out at what frequency the gain is equal to one both of the conditions are required if you set it correctly, yes. So then all of the. Uh, all, uh, but for the odd number of odd pies, right? So if that happens, uh, now this is a very specific case, right? Um, okay, fine. So if that happens, where you can have an oscillator that can oscillate at multiple points, then the initial conditions will determine. Uh, at which of these oscillation points it is going to oscillate? For example, if you want to make it oscillate at some frequency which corresponds to n equals to 3 or 4 or something, but if it is the opposite of n equals to 1, if both the criteria are satisfied, it is possible to make it oscillate at that frequency. Yeah, but both of the conditions are fulfilled for n equals to 1 to n equals to 3. Correct. But we want the frequency of we want the frequency of any uh, corresponding to any frequency of one. So, but it's taking longer to. Uh, you will have to provide some fluctuation. Uh, so that it, uh, yeah. So typically, whichever has higher gain, whichever uh, oscillation modes have higher gain, that will that is likely to dominate, right? But if you if all of them have similar gains and you want to get the oscillator to oscillate in a particular frequency you will have to adjust the initial condition such that it locks to that point. Uh, the principles of... Once it starts oscillating at one frequency... Uh, but if it has already started oscillation at one point, it's likely to continue in that rather than switch. And if you are interested in this uh, part, you can look at uh, concepts of injection locking and how to initialize uh, oscillators that have multiple modes of oscillation. Okay, so now uh, I also want to bring your attention to an interesting fact here. So if I look at the circuit, right, this circuit has mainly two components. You have a resistor and you have a transistor whose output is connected to the gate through some delay delta t right so let me redraw this like this right <laughs> any comments on what you think will be the impedance of this part can you quickly calculate what is the impedance so let me call this as some Z1. I want to calculate this impedance at the oscillation frequency. Right, but tell me the value of the impedance at omega naught. 1 by gm is incorrect. Minus 1 by gm. So, j omega naught into delta t, what is omega naught? Pi by delta t. Right? So, the impedance z1 of j omega naught, you would have gotten this as 1 by gm. How would you calculate this impedance? Uh, you take this circuit alone. So, take this part of the circuit alone, give a v test, find out what is the i test, and then you can calculate the impedance based on that. And that will come out to be 1 by gm into e power minus, sorry, plus j omega naught into delta t, right? Where omega naught was equal to, <coughs> sorry, you will have the minus in here. Where omega naught is equal to pi by delta t. You will have the plus sign, is it? e power minus s delta no, t, right? Yes, this is e power minus s delta t. 
where s gets replaced by j omega naught. Yeah. Ah, right. Uh, no, this is correct. This will uh, keep our. This is in the denominator. It becomes plus. Correct. So this equal to minus one by g m, right? Now, any comments on what should be the value of r? R has to be one by g m, right? So now my circuit at omega naught simplifies to r. Anyways, you have designed to be one by g m, and this circuit becomes minus one by g m. And what is the overall impedance? Yeah. Is it zero? Yeah. It has to be infinite. You have two resistances in parallel, where one is. Yeah, yeah. Whether I see it from side or up, it still has to be. <laughs> Admittance. <laughs> okay. So. Uh, this actually uh, points to another view of looking at oscillators, uh, wherein you find out what is the impedance at omega naught, and you at, so you find out what is the lossy component, the real part of the uh, impedance, and then you try to cancel it out by attaching an equivalent negative resistance. So we'll take a look at that way of thinking about oscillators after some sections, but this is a hint towards uh, that point. Okay, so now let me give you another example. Yes. In the condition B, how this output impedance going to be integrated with the system? So you take a system. Uh, originally, we talked about how the transfer function has to go to infinity, right? Now. It's not necessary that we are looking at uh, two different uh, points for input and output. You could be considering both the input and output at the same point, right? So it, now we are input. We are not giving any input. Correct. But for the uh, calculation, we had to initially look at a transfer function, and we talked about how that transfer function has to be uh, infinite at that oscillation frequency. Because there is no input to the system, so if you want a finite stable output, the gain has to be infinite, right? So now the idea is, instead of looking at two different points as input and output, you consider input and output to be the same point. Now, if I inject the current, and if the gain is infinite, I would expect the voltage to be infinite, which means the impedance is infinite. <coughs> that is a rudimentary way of thinking about how this condition came out of it. It is, you are exciting it with something at the oscillation frequency and then observing how the system changes. We are just exciting it with some oscillation frequency and then just keeping it there. Correct. This is a steady state, so uh, it is a sinusoidal current. You are injecting some I of J omega, so I of J omega naught and observing V of J omega naught. At steady state, I of j omega naught is zero. These are, uh, if I say I of j omega naught, uh, it's a sinusoidal steady state. It is a sinusoidal current. Okay. So now let me give you one more circuit. Quickly tell me if this can oscillate. So I take the circuit that we found will not oscillate, right? So now you know that if I connect the input and output together like this, this is not going to oscillate. So I cascade one more stage like this. Yeah. Huh. You can, so you are saying that the capacitor is delaying the signal to some extent. Uh, why are you saying no? Yeah, 
I think it's still the same thing, right? This year is frequency independent. Frequency independent. So not frequency independent. It will just pass from that green to the gate without the error. Ha, but the uh, you are adding some delay from from here to here. There is some delay in the. But again, you are adding a pole. You are talking about some system slowing down because of a pole, yeah. right? So uh, th there is some system is slowing down. So in some sense, there is some delay introduced in the system from here to here. But that delay is not sufficient. Right. So if you had a falling edge here, the falling edge here is going to happen after some delta t. This will not happen if it is a capacitor. This will not happen if it is a capacitor. That is true. Right. The capacitor is going to uh, introduce a phase shift. Okay. Now, uh, because this is uh, linear analysis, uh, maybe we should think in terms of small signal uh, <coughs> signals, right? So, if I take a sinusoid, then that sinusoid is given some phase shift, right? So, here if I take another sinusoid, the sinusoid is getting shifted by delta t. So we just had to find out uh, what is the condition, uh, what what would be, so what we found out is if the sinusoidal frequency was two times delta t, then the uh, system is going to oscillate. Yeah, both of them the phase is added, the system is not able to add sufficient phase. It can add only 90 degree phase shift. So you need to be able to add at least 180 degree phase shift for the system to oscillate. Okay. But that is actually a very nice question. <coughs> now let's say I took uh, a complicated system. I'll, you can think about this, right? I took something like this and I somehow add multiple poles. Do you think you can make this to get this to oscillate? Is the question clear? Yeah. Uh, then you can think about it. Right? Yeah. So, uh, so I took two of these stages and I connected it from output to input. Can this oscillate? Feel free to discuss and let, let me know. One stage is providing 90 degree. Overall, it is 180 degree. Everybody agrees. Can this oscillate? It can't os oscillate. Why? Why? Why won't this oscillate? No, no. What we observed was a different circuit. We observed a circuit in which there was a connection like this. Right now, I have cascaded two stages, and then the output is connected to the input. Yeah, yeah. It's the transfer function. Transfer function is. It is positive feedback. So. Negative and then again negative. Okay. But the phase can change by the transport. Any answers from the back? Feel free to discuss before giving me an answer. Why are you this one? You can add that to the right. This is common source, right? Common chain one. This is common source. Can you add common chain configuration? Can you? Common chain configuration. You can use any gain stage. And common chain will have positive one, right? Positive gain. Right. So, uh, there are multiple possible implementations for an oscillator. I am interested in currently knowing whether this can oscillate. You can implement any gain stage followed by a pole. It doesn't matter. Both 
both poles are right now okay at the same location why not i can always choose rd and cl as required rd and cl are design parameters for you input noise so imagine that we will initialize the circuit sufficiently right uh, so the noise is wide band that is one part or maybe we introduce fluctuations in the vdd or so don't worry about the startup right is there any frequency at which this can oscillate is the question yes so this will oscillate provided we choose gm and okay so if i have a, a system with two poles right at what frequency do you achieve minus 180 degree infinity right so that itself is a red flag but the circuit has something <coughs> fundamentally wrong what is the polarity of the dc feedback positive. positive so if the dc feedback is positive which means that Uh, for example let's say this was increasing right and and this was decreasing which means this will increase eventually this is going to reach vdd and this is going to reach ground the circuit is going to latch up so if you have dc positive feedback the system is going to latch up provided that the gain in the loop is greater than unity Okay. And it's not positive feedback for all frequencies because the uh, based on the values of uh, R D and C L, the system is going to introduce different phase shifts for different frequencies. But at D C you have positive feedback. Okay, and this is very similar to the case where you have two inverters connected like this. This is a memory unit. It's going to latch up. yeah so if you have positive dc feedback where the gain is greater than or equal to 1 your system is going to latch up one more ha, one more <laughs> common so stage then it will yeah right but the condition that you have to remember is you need to have dc negative feedback and a positive feedback at the oscillation frequency you need to have negative feedback at dc so that your circuit doesn't latch up and a positive feedback at the oscillation frequency this is <laughs> you can think of it as an it's a latch okay so just for completeness let's say i take the same circuit and i add a negative one in the path somehow can this oscillate because now it is dc negative feedback but you still have the problem that you get 180 degree phase shift only at infinity okay so of course we tried uh, one stage we then try cascading two stages the natural next step is to see if i cascade three stages can i get an oscillation right so please try that Thank <laughs> you. 
रूट थ्री बाय आर सी So I can I'm representing this as some a naught cube plus one plus s by omega p the whole cube. What did you get as angle of h of j omega naught? What is the expression? This is minus three tan inverse yeah, omega naught. Times R C, this should be equal to minus pi, okay? and that will give you the result as omega naught will be equal to root three by R C. Everyone got this? You get omega naught R C equal to tan of pi by three. What is tan of pi by three? Root. Okay. And what is the constraint you got on the magnitude? You need both constraints, right? This should be equal to one. So, G M R, the whole cube. Should sorry. Uh, this is. Ah, so you put the whole magnitude uh, constraint. The magnitude will be G M R, the whole cube divided by cube of root of one plus mega naught square r square C L square. Now, what is this factor? This is equal to three, right? You have the condition derived here. So this is equal to three. So you have three plus one four, root of four. So this whole thing reduces down to whole thing reduces down to two. So this gives you the condition that G M R should be equal to two. Okay. So let me call this node as V X. This is V Y, and this is V Z. Okay. Each stage is providing a gain of two. Right? How much phase shift is each stage providing? 60 degrees right minus 60 degrees now you also have to remember there is a negative sign from here to here right so if i were to look at vx and vy you will see that the phase shift is either minus 240 degrees or you can also think of it as plus 120 degrees is that okay so there is a minus 60 degrees phase shift plus a minus sign because the gain from vx to vy is minus gm into the impedance right so that minus sign you can either think of it as plus 180 or minus 180 so if i uh, think of it as minus 180 then it is minus 180 minus 60 you have a total phase of uh, 240 degrees minus 240 degrees so i can then sketch vx Right. So this point will be 180 degree. This is 270 degree. So your 240 degrees will be somewhere here. 
so my vy is basically this waveform shifted by 240 degrees so it will be somewhere here and then i can also plot my vz which is this waveform shifted again so now you can look at any point beyond this and this is how your steady state vx vy and vz will look like okay so a quick question how hard do you think it will be to meet this constraint angle of h of j omega not equal to 1 sorry magnitude of h of j omega not equal to 1 why it does uh, so with pvt it's not uh, guaranteed that you will always have this magnitude to be equal to 1 right and because of this we generally tend to over design instead of making it equal to 1 we would define design it such that this angle uh, is greater than 1 right now if i have this to be greater than 1 do you think our transfer function will go to infinity at omega naught okay. so we started off with some transfer function closed loop transfer function of the form h of j omega by 1 plus h of j omega and for the denominator to go to 0, the magnitude of h of j omega had to be equal to 1. Okay? Now we are making it to be greater than 1, then it will not go to infinity at omega naught. What happens is this transfer function gamma of s equal to h of s plus by 1 plus h of s is going to go to infinity for some s which is equal to a complex number of the form sigma plus j omega is that clear now we are going to look at this particular scenario taking the example of the circuit we just solved right so i will use transfer function of this form if h of s is of this form can you quickly tell me the poles for gamma of s tell me the denominator My h of s is of the form some a naught q by 1 plus s by omega p the whole q. Huh. So, the, what is the denominator? Should be of the form 1 plus a naught cube by 1 plus s by omega p the whole q right so i will multiply it so that i will have it in the form of a standard denominator so you will have something like this okay so i am going to simplify this this is of the form a cube plus b cube so this will be equal to a plus b into a square minus a b plus b square right so i can write this as a naught plus 1 plus s by omega p into 1 plus s by omega p the whole square minus a naught into 1 plus s by omega p plus a naught the whole square and i can solve this to find out the location of the poles Is that okay? So, can you tell me one pole location immediately? Minus omega p into 1 plus a naught. Right? I will give you the pole locations corresponding to this. So, let me call this as s2 comma 3. This is equal to a naught by 2 minus 1 into omega p plus or minus j into root 3 by 2 
into a naught into omega p. Sorry? Ah, this is omega p. Okay, so far okay? Stop me if you have any confusion. Okay? So now I want to look at the pole location. We will start by looking at the pole location for the case where we know we are going to get oscillations. Right? And what is the case where we are guaranteed? What should be the value of A0 to get oscillations? So A0 was equal to GMR. To get oscillations in the system, GMR should have been equal to 2. So which means A0 is equal to 2. Now I am drawing the uh, sigma and j omega axis here so that I can mark the poles. Put A0 equal to 2 and quickly tell me the three pole locations. Tell me this, where is this? This is at minus 3 omega p. What about these two? So this is at root 3 omega p. Okay. This was your oscillation frequency earlier. Right. You got your oscillation frequency as root 3 by rc where I have called that 1 by rc as omega p. Right. So all that this is telling you is to have perfect oscillations, you should have your poles on the j omega axis. Is that clear? Right. Now what happens if you, the value of a0 was lesser than 2 and given that a0 consists of gm and r, you expect it to be between 0 and 2. Right. right. The poles are going to be, so you will have one pole here and the other two poles are on the LHP. Poles on the LHP means a stable system which is not what we want right now. Right. So corresponding to a pole like this, let us say I had a pole uh, say S2 of the form sigma, uh, no, let us consider the example of S1. Right. This is a real pole. Right. What do you expect to see in the time domain? If you had a pole, you know this, you have seen this before. Right. If you have a pole on the LHP, on the real axis, in time domain, what sort of response do you expect to see because of this pole? Exponentially decreasing. Right. You expect to see something of the form. So if this was sigma 1, e power sigma 1 t. Right. And what would these two contribute to? So this is going to be a decaying oscillator. So the envelope of that oscillation is going to decay exponentially and you will see some ringing in between. Right? Now if A0 is greater than 2, what happens? So you will still have one pole on the LHP on the real axis, <coughs> this is sigma axis, this is j omega and you will have two poles on the RHP. So the system is unstable and because the poles are on the RHP, this is going to be growing exponentially. So the envelope is going to grow like this and then you will have the oscillation with increasing amplitude. Is that okay? So now when you design where with the poles falling on the RHP, you would expect the oscillations to increase in amplitude, right? But then eventually we are implementing all of these things using transistors. So the transistors are going to, uh, their gain is going to drop because they are going to come out of the region of operation that you expect. And because of these non-linearities, eventually the gain, the amplitude is also going to stabilize. Is that okay? Now if you think of an oscillator which is starting out, the oscillation is slowly starting, in the initial phases of the oscillation where the amplitude is very small, the linear analysis is valid. 
right? The gain is going to be whatever you designed for. Eventually, as the amplitudes are increasing, the gain is going to drop, right? And because of this, you can think of the poles starting out in the RHP and then slowly moving towards the J omega axis. And if you have a, a full blown oscillation, let's assume that you have an oscillation like this. Now, of course, for the maximum and minimum amplitudes of this oscillation, you would expect the gain to be smaller than whatever you designed for. At the bias points, you would expect the oscillation, uh, so at the bias points within this oscillation, you would expect the gain to be greater than 2, which is what you would now design for. You would design for magnitude of h of j omega naught to be greater than 2. So here you would expect the gain to be greater than 2, such that on an average, during a cycle, the gain is roughly equal to 2. Right? So the most of the oscillatory systems that you deal with are going to be nonlinear in nature. Because of which, all of these linear analysis is not technically valid, right? But it still gives you a good approximation about the initial frequency, the startup conditions required, and the steady state frequency. Uh, at least to uh, first order, it is going to give you an estimate. So, if you start with the gain of, let's say, three, it will stabilize. You will still see stable oscillations, uh, and. Sorry? The overall gain of the loop. <laughs> it has to be one when it is achieving steady state, right? Otherwise, uh, you would see growing oscillations. But initially, I will see growing oscillations. Initially, you if would I see start growing oscillations. Not greater than huh. Initially, because uh, initially, when you power on the circuit, everything is at either 0 or VDD, right? So from there, it has to grow. So the oscillation will grow during which state the uh, small signal analysis is valid and then eventually it will settle to. Yeah. And so this is the final frequency though, which is the frequency that you to That is a very good question. So if you look at only the theory, right, let us say this we said that this is let us say equal to some uh, sigma 2 plus j omega 2, right. If I look at only the theory, it should and if the linear analysis was valid, it looks like it has to settle to omega 2, right? Because the uh, sinusoidal frequency will be at omega 2. But because the system can also be nonlinear, this would actually depend on circuit implementations. And I can quickly give you an example for this, right? Let us say I took a inverter based oscillator. Right, which basically at this point is just a fancy way of saying that I took three inverters together mm -hmm. and put it in a loop. Now, if I wanted to calculate uh, the criteria for oscillation based on Barkhausen's criteria, I can think of each inverter as each inverter like this where I club all the capacitance associated with this node to a CL. I consider the channel length modulation. So this will give me an ROP on the PMOS and an RON on the NMOS side. All right. So the effective resistance at that node will be some ROP parallel RON. Right. Now you can quickly compare this with the three stage common source amplifier based oscillator we created and can you tell me what is the omega naught for oscillation? Root 3 by? Root 3 by? Uh, ROP parallel RON into CL, right? which means I can find out F naught as some root 3 by 2 pi into 1 by ROP parallel RON into CL. Okay. But this is a regular inverter based uh, oscillator that you have seen. If the delay of one inverter was equal to TD, what would be the oscillation frequency? Let me call this as F1, 1 by 6 TD. Okay. 
So one is based on only small signal analysis, the other is based on large signal analysis. Right? And it turns out your actual frequency of oscillation is going to be closer to this value and you would typically see your F1 to be smaller than F0. So this way you may have to uh, look at the circuit from both small signal and large signal model to see how the what sort of frequency you expect at the output. Sorry? Where is 1 upon 6 TD? 1 upon 6 TD is coming. Okay. So, um, let's say I took 3 inverters like this, right. If I assume a rising edge here, so this is let's say O1, O2, O3, O4, I will connect like this, same as O1. <coughs> so, if O1 is, O1 has a rising edge, what happens to O2? It will have a falling edge. Let's assume that the delay between these two is TD. Now O3 will have a rising edge, then O1 will have a falling edge corresponding to that. So from the rising edge to falling edge, how much time did we take? <coughs> did I make a mistake? So O1 to O2, O2 to O3, O3 to... Huh, so there is one TD here and there is one more TD here. So this is three times TD, right. Now this process will repeat again, right, corresponding to the falling edge, eventually you will have a rising edge, right. And what would be this delay? This is also three TD. So the delay of a ring oscillator like this is twice of number of stages, which is three here, into the delay of the inverter. So, this will be the period of oscillation, okay. So, any further questions on this? Okay, good. So, then we move on to… Because uh, this has been derived based on large signal analysis, right. Whereas uh, this equation was derived based on small signal analysis. Initially, it will start oscillating uh, here. Now, as the uh, oscillation amplitude grows and it reaches a large signal picture, then you will see it. If you are starting out, let's say, uh, because midpoint voltage is also a possible solution, let's say you are starting out at midpoint voltage, right. So yeah. then the initially the oscillations are going to be small signal in nature. So then it is valid. Then right? Eventually it uh, goes up to uh, big, yeah, yeah. And in which case the small signal model itself is not valid. And another thing to keep in mind is here I have drawn nice square wave looking shapes, but if you have only three stages, it is likely to look like a very distorted sine wave because uh, the TD is going to be small, right. So by the time the signal has gone from 0 to VDD, it will be time for it to come down. So as you increase the number of stages, the square wave will look more and more like a regular square wave. But for three stages, it is going to look like a very distorted, I, you can call it as distorted square wave or a distorted sinusoid. The waveform shape is, uh, if you were expecting a waveform shape like this, instead what you would see is probably something like this. By the time it reaches VDD, it is time for it to fall down. Okay. So, then uh, we move on to what is called as an LC tank. What is an LC tank? Simply an inductor parallel with the capacitor. Right? Can you quickly calculate what is Z of J omega? Right. Can you give me the expression? Huh. So, in terms of J omega, so J omega L, 
divided by 1 minus omega square lc right can you plot the magnitude of z of g omega and angle of z of g omega What does the magnitude look like? <coughs> so, at a magic frequency omega naught, which is equal to 1 by root LC, you will have infinite impedance. Okay. And how does angle of Z of J omega look like? What do you get? 90 degree constant. So let us look at that answer, right? So the answer I am getting is it is going to be a 90 degree constant, right? That seems to suggest that the expression is of the form of j omega into something, right? Nothing else. Now I am looking at an inductor parallel with capacitor. At very low frequencies, what would be the impedance contributed by the capacitor? It is going to be very, very high, which means the parallel combination is going to be dominated by the inductor. So, for low frequencies, you expect to see j omega into L. Now, consider very high frequency. So, the parallel combination has to be dominated by the capacitor. Right? So, in which case you would see 1 by j omega c. So, that itself tells you that the answer, it is a constant plus 90 is wrong. It has to. So, at what frequency does it change the sign? You can look at this and tell me. Yeah. So, at omega equal to 1 by root LC, it is going to change. For all the other frequencies, it is going to be plus 90 or omega naught, this is going to be minus 90. This is okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, basically the discussion we did here is how you would have done a sanity check for the results after you have obtained these results. Right? Now, typically when you implement the inductor using metal lines, it is going to have, can you look at this and tell me if it is going to be sharp or not? It has to be sharp. Right? Typically when you implement an inductor, you will also have a series resistance with it because the metal lines you use for implementing the inductor will have an associated resistance, right? So, now instead of having an LC tank which was just an L and a parallel capacitor, you are dealing with a circuit like this, okay? So, let me call this as L1 and C1, right? It can have other parasitics with it, but generally the RS of the inductor is more critical uh, in a lot of applications. That is the limiting factor. Right? Maybe we can? Not directly to RS, you will have to, right? So now, our calculations are going to be much, much easier if these were simply, you know, uh, three components. So, three components in parallel. Okay. We have to deal with this circuit where inductor comes in series with a resistor parallel with a capacitor, but our calculations, our life would be much easier if we could have modeled it as some combination of LP, RP, no change comes to the capacitor C1. Is it possible to find a circuit like this yeah. to replace this yeah. for all frequencies? Correct. So, all that I am saying is this L1 series RS should be made equal to an LP parallel RP. So, the question is can I do this replacement for all frequencies?
the best way to check is put for omega equal to 0, right? If omega equal to 0, uh, this becomes Rs, whereas this becomes shorted, right? So it's not possible to do this replacement for all frequencies. But you can do this for a very, for a particular frequency, you can make both equal, definitely not at DC, right? And around that frequency, let's say we choose some frequency omega naught. So for this omega naught, we can make both equal to both circuits identical and around this omega naught we can say that the circuits are closely matched so that we make some minor errors in the calculation but it is okay enough to get a result very quickly okay so of course now the question is uh, given us a given a frequency omega can you find out what is the relationship between l1 and lp and rs and rp you know, you shouldn't get anything as negative. You solve it for some omega, that's enough. So, the LHS is going to be RS plus J omega L1, right? What is the impedance of this? Those two in parallel, give me the expression. J omega LPRP divided by RP plus J omega LP. So you want both of them to be equal for some omega. What did you get as RP? R square plus omega square R square. Is this L1 or LP? L1. R square plus, okay. So whole by RS. Whole by RS. So this I can write as R square plus. R square. Ah, sorry. R S plus omega square L1 by R S. Is this ah, okay? This is fine. Oh, you solve it for some omega, right? As long as now I just want to add one more variable here, right? Given an inductor with a series resistance like this, we can define what is called as the quality factor for the inductor. Okay, so have you heard of this quality factor before? <coughs> what is the expression for quality factor? So this is going to be omega L1 divided by Rs. An easy way to remember is numerator is the desired quantity, denominator is the undesired part in it. There are multiple definitions for so quality so factor. So, so uh, right, I am looking at L1 series with RS. So the uh, I think the definition is energy stored by energy dissipated. Uh, so for this circuit uh, where L1 comes in series with RS, and this is a good result to remember. This is something you'll keep using is simply omega L1 by Rs. So the numerator is the desired impedance, denominator is the undesirable part in that impedance. Okay. So the equations that you are deriving uh, for relating L1 to LP and Rs to RP, if you can include the quality factor also in that, the expressions become easier to remember. And a reasonable assumption to make is that the quality factor is usually large because you want an inductor, not a resistor, right? So, I will stop the class here. Please do the derivation Did before R next class. Uh, RP is RS into Q square. R S plus
R S plus Q square. Does it is is it dimensionally correct? Okay. 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 Okay.